So welcome to Sustainability Explorer. This is the first episode interview uh, that we are recording on the video. As you know, every week I'm inviting one professional in the field of sustainability across any industry to shed some light on the questions that bother me, that bug me. This week it's uh, fashion and my guest today is Claudia Sherakovsky, who has the very interesting uh, position name, Circular Fashion Consultant. And you are now working with the eco-intelligent growth. Growth yes. in Barcelona, yes. Spain. <laughs> Claudia, yes. first of all, um, introduce yourself a little bit more. I checked your LinkedIn profile. You have a very interesting career path. Please tell us where you have started and where, how did you get where you are now? Yeah, okay. So, um, big, big question. So, I started, um, so I'm Polish, but I was born and raised in the States. Um, and I was studying there and, and during high school and growing up and I heard first about like the scarcity of materials like oil when I was 13, I remember in middle school and that got me like investigating what's, what's happening. And then I read about all of these issues on the planet, like the ozone and, and climate change and waste. And I was like, why is nobody telling us this? And why is nobody doing anything? <laughs> So I, I was very young. I was about 13, 14 when I started getting very active um, first as a teenage uh, environmental activist. So I started a, a, the, my high school's environmental club to raise awareness and to start projects there, um, recycling and planting trees. Um, and then when it came time for college, uh, for university, I said, uh, okay, what can I do with environmental? And I just plugged it in. What are my options? And uh, there was environmental scientists and environmental um, engineering. And I said, I think environmental engineering is the hardest. So I'll do that one. And cool so I studied cool that uh, for my bachelor's. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, kind of a spontaneous decision for something that was uh, so difficult. But um, I'm really happy that I did that because it really set um, a strong foundation of problem solving, which I think sustainability is such a big problem. And uh, it helped me kind of gather those skills. Um, so then I was working for an aerospace company for a while um, in my home state in Connecticut and uh, it was super interesting but I was reading all these articles about what's happening in Europe and all these new concepts and innovations and I was like I want to do that and so I decided to do my master's um, at TU Delft um, in, in Holland and I studied industrial uh, ecology so this is uh, thinking in systems um, and really trying to get our industrial system more like the, the biological system. So the natural world, there's no such thing as waste. There's no mm -hmm. toxic materials. These are all man-made things so, or concepts. Um, so I, I yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of get a bigger view of, of how to apply these concepts to business. And um, yeah, I also uh, started seeing some things. So I, I noticed that fashion was one of the most polluting, one of the biggest issues when it comes to waste. Mm -hmm. um, that's always kind of been my, my avenue. I'm not sure why, but um, I saw it was built environment and fashion. And then I thought, well, built environment, it seems like people are doing a lot of things. It seems kind of un under control. And it seems like um, the fashion world is really needing some creativity or um, some changes. And it's so complex as well. Um, so I actually started a startup. Um, I had the idea in the States, it's very common now, rent the runway of clothing rental. And I saw this was not happening in Europe. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start one. And uh, it was a little idealistic um, because we were just students. We were like a group of three students and we were doing this. And the idea was so huge. And it's that was so, the cure, cure clothing, right? Cure. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, the idea was an online um, clothing library. So the, the, there's a, a, a physical clothing library in Amsterdam called Lena, um, but we wanted to do it online. So it was a little bit more scalable and uh, perhaps with everyday clothing or subscription basis. We had so many ideas, but putting it into practice, we found uh, it was quite difficult. Um, but I'm really happy I learned a lot about entrepreneurship. Um, and then also in my studies, I focused a lot on like, strategy, uh, like strategy and change management. Uh, applying that to sustainability and to 
the organizations who are trying to become more sustainable. Um, I did my thesis with IKEA mm -hmm. uh, about this, create, helping them create their circular economy strategy um, based on what, what would that look like for the customer. So we use a methodology called backcasting, which was very cool. Um, and we're actually using it today in, in the company where I am now. So when Cure didn't work out and I finished my master's, uh, I ended up in Barcelona and I met uh, my workmates at Eco Intelligent Growth one week after I arrived and uh, started working with them. And it's been really a cool journey understanding. So we work a lot with cradle to cradle uh, line of thinking. So a lot with the certification. And this has allowed me to really go into the nitty gritty, the details of what's happening in fashion, what does this mean, um, and really get a clear idea of the of the challenges that are happening in, in fashion today. Mm -hmm. One of my previous guests, Lincoln Blevins, from the episode called Every Job is a Sustainability Job, he mentioned that take like how to be a sustainability officer it's not just what is stated on your cv or, or on your linkedin profile you go into the most pollutant industry and you slowly integrate uh, sustainability concepts in that industry and that's exactly what you're talking about and you know i recently read somewhere that uh, fashion is polluting more than um Avia, avia industry and maritime industry combined and i was like fashion who could have yeah. that yeah i think um there's a lot of information out there so a lot of the most quoted statistic is that it's the second most polluting mm -hmm. um i've seen I, I saw that originally that's why i got into it but then later i read it's around the fifth but yeah it is it is extremely polluting and it's a bit shocking at the scale of the system, but also the way the system works to even wrap your head around the system and, and to kind of coordinate when there's so many different actors and there's so many, um, even different schools of thought around sustainability, how we should do it, um, that, that it, it can get confusing and it's, it's not easy. And I don't know, that's why it excites me so much. I think. Yeah. <laughs> What do you, your position is now called a circular fashion consultant. What does it mean and what does it entail exactly? So we help uh, brands and, and manufacturers uh, in the fashion, um, fashion world um, to look at their product and their company uh, and see what can they do to be more circular? Uh, what can they do to be more sustainable? We have um, outlined a vision of what the ideal factory would be like. So, you know, every, every factory would know all the chemistry that they're using, so all the chemicals, and, and have it optimized so that it's safe and healthy for people and the workers and for the products, um, that they're designing for circularity, that they're helping to, you know, make this system happen because it really is a system change to get everybody on board. Um, we're also talking about um, renewable energy or at least carbon. Like let's, instead of saying, uh, let's reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions, let's absorb more carbon than we're emitting um, and, and using a factory in order to do that. Um, that's something that we've outlined as well. And, and why can't, you know, factories, um, you know, clean more water. So the water that's coming out of the factory is cleaner than any water that's coming in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, in my opinion, there's never good or evil. Like the fashion industry isn't good or evil. Um, just like anything like the internet or any tool like a hammer, it can be used for good or evil. So let's start using it for good. So we really are trying to switch the conversation and the paradigm, how we talk about um, fashion and, and changing the conversation to see it as a way to do more good uh, rather than just less bad. Doing more good, does it mean that technology becomes more expensive? That's a, a valid argument for most of the industries. Like, okay, we're, we're going to change our processes and our operations, but then can it be that it will cost us more? Um, so it depends. Because initially, yes, if you talk about it on a, on a financial level, but then we aren't taking in a lot of uh, costs that, are non-financial so um for example you know well yeah so you have the, the idea of externalities 
So, you know, when we have a product, we have a $5 t-shirt, you know, that's how much it costs uh, to make and to, uh, for all the raw materials, there's a lot into it, but it doesn't take into account, um, you know, the, the people, uh, their health, uh, if, if their health is de decreased, the uh, if water was polluted, the greenhouse gas emissions that, that came from that. There's a lot of things that aren't taken into consideration today um, when it comes to cost, but it doesn't necessarily have to be more costly. And sometimes, I mean, when you talk about sustainability measures, it, it actually saves you money in, in certain areas. So maybe not directly, but, you know, in, or, or in, instead of speaking about dollars or euros or, or you know, um, currency, I say, yeah. talking about it like in terms of, of um, like energy even, mm -hmm. uh, energy in the sense like, like for example, I like one one thing. Like there's so much, and when you talk about compliance, there's so much administration, right? Like to make sure that you know the government is aware and that we're in compliance. Like there's a person who just does that. Mm -hmm. But if you take away all of the all of the harmful chemicals, if you stop emitting carbon, you don't need that person anymore. So makes it, sense. Yeah. So you don't have to do as much documentation because you're not emitting anything. You're actually absorbing harmful things and, and cleaning them for society. So it's kind of a different direction mm -hmm. uh, instead of being regulated and having to do all that administrative work, it is totally eliminated with the idea of just, just doing things simply. It can be very simple to, to do more good, I think. Absorbing carbon, what do you mean by that? How are you talking about new technologies? I read an article uh, not further away than yesterday, by the way, uh, on The Guardian about new materials that um, textile kind of uh, that absorbs carbon and purifies air. Is it what you mean? The, the innovation in, in fashion? That can be one avenue for sure, but it's also not necessary. I mean, if you think about a cotton plant, it's absorbing carbon. <laughs> so thinking about products as as carbon banks and buildings as carbon banks or I mean the biggest one is soil so for example my favorite one is is the idea of regenerative farming so our soil can really absorb a lot of the carbon that because carbon isn't necessarily bad I say carbon but I mean all greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. you know carbon is not necessarily a bad thing thing like I like fashion or or the you know the or internet money. Or, or money we need carbon to survive so it's a it, the problem is that it's in the wrong place so if we can take it from the air and put it back into the soil that's that's the direction where we need to go and actually we don't think about uh what's fashion's role in this so you know we I think 40 percent of the fiber that we use are cotton mm -hmm. um and if it's organic cotton that's I'm pretty sure that it's it's the same as regenerative. So they use practices that allow the soil to rest. Um, they don't. Uh, it's about so it's there's no pesticides, so the microbes in the soil can stay alive, and the microbes are the ones that are mm -hmm. converting that carbon into something accessible mm -hmm. uh, for the plant. Um, so it's very interesting. Also, animals, wool, uh, you know, leather. Um, I think leather gets a bad rap, but it's actually a byproduct of the meat industry. Um, but it doesn't, the meat industry doesn't necessarily have to be um, demonized or something terrible. It's just that the, the industrial meat industry is the problem. If we do it in a regenerative way, we can actually reduce our carbon emissions by making sure that the land is uh, managed properly, that, that, you know, the microbes can stay and they can absorb that carbon. Right. So, I mean, one way is this, this technological application, but in my opinion, I don't think it's very necessary. I think it's more about focusing on, on absorbing, you know, back into the soil uh, through traditional methods or things that we've known for a very long time. Um, and then also, yeah, looking at the, at the, the manufacturing facilities and seeing like, okay, how can they, what's their part in this and um, going to renewable energies and producing more renewable energy than they actually need or as a service to the community. Um, there's so many ways, so mm -hmm. there's so many different avenues, at least. How are brands buying the idea of circularity? I think it's a buzzword these days. So people, brands are, are, 
are in it, are on it. Yeah, I think um, it's it's nice. We get a kind of a view of the entire supply chain. So we work with brands, manufacturers, and, and um, mm -hmm. suppliers, and we see we see the circular the circularity of the system. So um, I think at first there can be some resistance. So it, it depends what you mean by circularity. So for for a lot of brands, they see it as uh, recycling. Mm -hmm. Um, which is not necessarily circularity. There's many different steps. So you want to reduce, reuse, recycle before, um, or repair before you recycle. Right. So they're, they're now setting up the infrastructure for recycling. So they work a lot with, um, you know, third parties. Uh, you, for many stores, you can go back and return any of your garments. Mm -hmm. um, like H&R. Yeah, like H&M, CNA, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can go there and then put back your stuff. And then they work with a third party, which helps to bring uh, those things, ICO, it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, I talked with a woman who, who set up this program uh, and she explained it to me. It was very cool. She used to work at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Um, and so, so ICO takes the garments, they bring them to India where it's sorted. Uh, and then it's actually cool to hear because some, we have a lot of clients in Pakistan and um, then we hear, yeah, Ico is bringing these, these garments or at least denim uh, to, to the clients and they're making it into new products. So it's kind of nice to see that that circle is happening. Um, the efficiency of it is another thing. So we need to start um, increasing the, the efficiency. Uh, I think the companies are now eight to fifteen percent uh, circular when it, when you're talking about recycling. Um, but I think there's also a little bit of I mean it's also an opportunity, and I think some companies like H and M are taking advantage of it. For example, with the rental model, um, I'm a big fan of the rental model. But um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I know that they're using that as an opportunity. So I mean, people don't need to own their clothes anymore, especially the fancy ones that. Um, you know, you're only going to wear once for that wedding you have to go to, and then it's going to hang in your closet. Like it makes no sense mm -hmm. to buy that. So I think the, the big brands are finally getting on board and, and saying, Hey, we can, we can turn this into an opportunity. And it's so true. It's totally an opportunity for, for a new way of, of, of fashion and retail. Mm -hmm. Speaking of H&M, I had uh, mixed feelings about that um, return uh, what was it yeah. called? Re return program. Yeah, I so thought it actually stimulated more consumption. You throw like two or five. I think it, I used to live in France, and when it only started, I was in France. In Ukraine, we just had H uh, and M open maybe one year ago. So it's very. Yeah. I still haven't been to H and M in Ukraine. So yeah. I was in France, and I remember uh, you give back like five things that you don't wear anymore, and you get a coupon. Yeah. Um, five, five euro, five euro off. Like the percent. purchase of like 30, 30 euro. So you already have that coupon, and you feel like, like it's kind of money on paper. So I have to use it. So you go back yeah. to H and M. You buy clothes that you will wear a couple of times. You will wash it up to five times and it goes back to that same bin in H&M. Mm. It's a little bit of a twisted um, approach. Yes, it's circular, but you have to know the context, you see. What's your, what's your opinion on that? Are you with fast fashion or against it? Um, it's hard to say. So I think there's, there's positive and negatives of both because in, I mean, in psychology, like you have to provide, if you want to change a behavior, you have to provide an incentive. So how I see it is that there's kind of steps, right? Like we can't go from zero to circular. Like we can't go from linear to circular in, in one night. So what I think that this uh, particular example served was, um, to get people to become aware that it's possible to bring your stuff to the store and to start this infrastructure. I mean, this circular system that I explained with ICO, I mean, it's not perfect either, but it's a start and that's what we really need. And, and I think it's, it's a good way to motivate people, but over time, I think that that could be phased out. I think it's true that it is incentivizing I think if you think about it in another way, it's true. Like you, 
H&M, like it's also, there's some responsibility on the consumer. So you can choose to purchase a product that you're going to wear many, many times for many years. I have products that are H&M. I bought maybe secondhand even Mm -hmm. um, ages ago, but I've worn them like maybe 50 times per year. They're my basics and I love them and they're good quality. They're lasting a long time. I have one of, of such things. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's from H&M. It's five years old. I'm still wearing it everywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's, I mean, it's, it can be good quality as well. You just have to choose correctly and also tell H&M that, you know, give them feedback that these products are the good ones. This, these are lasting me a long time and I want more of those. And, and to buy more of those products rather than the ones that are kind of cheaper. I think the, the biggest issue is, again, uh, is, is I'm not taking uh, responsibility away from the, from the brand, but um, it is a little bit up to the consumer to say, you know, to make that choice, to make that choice that to buy products that are going to last a long time, that are made with sustainable materials. Um, and then, again, asking, you know, if there's another way to consume, if they want to rent that, or if they want a place where they can go and repair it. If it's your favorite, you know, Mm t-shirt, like, I want that shirt forever. Like, I want to be able to repair it, but a lot of consumers don't know how. So it's it's tricky. It's a tricky question. Um, I think there's kind of both sides. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm I'm personally of the opinion that fast fashion, um, I think it, they should in my ideal world, that they would raise the prices a little bit just so that consumers understand. Because right now the message that consumers are getting is that this is cheap. I don't have to put a lot of effort to get it. So it's disposable. Yeah. And that's not how it should be. So my theory is that if we raised prices a little bit, people would start understanding, oh, this is something I have to work for. This is something I, mm-hmm. you know, I have to invest in. And if I invest in it, I'm going to take better care of it. I'm going to make it last as long as possible and perhaps even empower myself to understand how can I take care of it and how can I sew it you know there's mm-hmm. there's many options right yeah part of the circular economy rental business do you think people I noticed that people before had a perception of owning the thing it's mine it's my cd changed drastically now you don't have to own your um diskette or cds to to have your own music you can stream it online um clothing is a little bit tricky of a tricky subject as well as secondhand like it has to be mine how can i how will i possibly wear it after someone else how will i give it back i have to own it do people do you think people start changing this perception and, and, you know, going more into the direction of rental, using it a little bit, keeping it in a good state and passing it yeah. on. I think um, we're in the process of that change. So that's, I think, very much old way of thinking. But for example, I mean, that's the argument that it's very close to your skin, so it's very intimate. But when you go to a hotel, they're not buying new sheets every time. Those mm-hmm. sheets are just washed and, and returned, right? And you're sharing those sheets as well. Um, so it's the same with clothing rental. Um, you know, it's, it's being taken care of, it's being washed. Um, and yeah, a lot of the times it's not really necessary. It's not necessary to own that many clothes. And, and I know um, I like the rental model because I, I'm like many women, like to mix things up but I'm, I don't have the options. I don't have the, the money to buy only sustainable clothes. Um, you know, I try to invest in basics, but uh, it's, it's difficult to make your entire wardrobe sustainable overnight again. So I like the idea of rental because you have the possibility to change and be creative. And um, also the idea that, you know, you don't need to make as many. So a lot of the times fast fashion and, and fashion in general work on specific minimum quantities. So they have to, they're incentivized to make more and more and more. And with the rental model, it doesn't have to be that way. You can have, you know, um, small designers, local designers made in Europe. They can make one or two pieces and rent it out. Um, Kind of a new business model so that we can have more unique, you know, more uniqueness, uh, unique pieces, uh, more creativity, empowering local markets here in, in, um, in Europe. or or anywhere around the world. I mean, this is a little business model that can start being Mm -hmm. applied anywhere and and empowering local markets again. 
Right. The brands that seek for your services of a circular fashion consultant, uh, why do they come to you? Do they want to cut on costs? Do they see, I don't know, pressure from stakeholders, shareholders on their brands, like go into, go towards sustainability? What is the reason? I mean, there are so many demands these days from all sides. So it started off very bottom up with the market. So people started saying, this is not sustainable and I don't want this. And, and the company started to see their bottom line dropping that, that the younger consumers definitely don't want to buy, you know, a lot of cheap stuff. So um, the, the market, I think, is the original one. And then I think consumers are also becoming more educated. So they're learning more about where they're, they're more curious about what's in their clothes. What are they putting on their bodies? I think there's also this natural movement from, um, you know, the food that we eat. We became much more conscious that more people are eating organic or eating healthier. And then they said, okay, well, the next thing that's closest to me is my, my clothes. It's on my skin every day. So um, a bit of concern around that. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of market pressure. Um, now we're seeing, uh, you know, legislation. So a lot of the governments, uh, I think the Dutch are the leading ones, but you see the Scandinavian countries and, and Europe in general are saying, um, you know, by 2025, we have to have a take back system. We have to like, no clothes can go into the incinerator. So we have to start creating that system. So definitely legislative pressures as well. Um, and now you see the financial pressures. Shareholders are becoming more aware um, of circular metrics that are coming out. Um, so each company will start to have to measure how circular are they. Mm -hmm. And that will depend on how much, you know, the, on, on, on how much investment they get into the company, on their stock price and everything. So right. um, there's, there's pressure from all sides now. It's, it's like the, the direction to go. Yeah. What is in the circularity metrics? So, um, so yeah, in the nineties and the two thousands, we had sustainability metrics where like, uh, we could reduce, uh, you know, companies had to reduce how much water they were using, how much waste they were producing, um, then their carbon emissions. Now we have a number for circularity. So based on, um, my understanding is, is based on how much they're collecting back, uh, and producing into new garments, uh, they take like a percentage. So, for example, based on how much they sold versus how much they collected, they can come up with a percentage that this is how circular they are. Mm -hmm. um, so you get uh, basically in sustainability reporting, you usually get a baseline. So you start with one year. So 2020, you could measure this for a year and you have to, in, in this case, increase as the years go on. And usually companies will have a goal by 2025 to be 30 uh, percent circular, for example. Right. right. And on a more individual level, as a consumer, um, I'm very concerned about wh where my food is coming from. I'm trying to buy local, eat local. As for the clothing, I really have no idea. Where do I, as an individual, as a consumer, go um, in the first place to check uh, where my clothes are coming from? And what shall I look at? The type of the material or the quantity of clothes that I'm buying? What are my go-to um, resources? Yeah. Great question. So um, I would say there's a bit of a hierarchy. So the, the most sustainable clothing is the stuff that you already have. So this T-shirt that you have from H&M, like make it last as long as possible. Um, you know, learn to repair if you can. Um, and then swapping, perhaps uh, swapping or reselling. Um, maybe not a T-shirt in this, in this case, but if it's a dress, for example. Um, you know, talking with your friends, getting into your community. Uh, working with secondhand shops to make sure that somebody else um, locally can take make use of that garment. Um, there's a lot of clothing swaps these days, so it's just a matter of looking. Um, so that, and then perhaps perhaps exploring rental just for certain items. Um, and then if you have to, I mean, invest in really good quality, long-lasting garments. Um, so what, when it comes to those products, what I normally look at is what is the product made out of. So for example, this t-shirt is 98% um, tensile, uh, which I, I find it to be one of the most sustainable fibers that we have data on now. So um, I think from the last information I saw, it was hemp and linen because these are uh, can be grown locally mm -hmm. um, and require very little water, very little pesticides. Um, and there's a lot of hemp and linen coming into like blends that are coming into uh, the market these days. So 
um, definitely take an eye out for that. Uh, organic cotton, um, it's not only circ- like able to be recycled, but it's also very safe and very healthy. And like mm-hmm. I said, the regenerative aspect. Um, and then, yeah, these, these other fibers like pencil. Um, there's some new fibers that are coming out that are quite cool. I was on a panel in London two weeks ago, and uh, banana fiber is something. Oh, yeah. uh, pineapple leather. Pineapple. There's, yeah, there's so many things that are coming out. They're not scalable yet, and I, I haven't seen any um, LCAs or any studies that say mm-hmm. that they are definitely more sustainable. But I would say that my my top three, my top three choices are these uh, hemp slash linen, um, organic cotton, and, and tensile or lyocell. Is the mm-hmm. brand name. Um, so looking out for, for these products. Keeping the clothes for too long or long enough is a little bit boring. With, with the garments, it's, it's a tricky question. Like yeah. My mind understands that I have to keep it and use it as much as I can, yet I don't want it's to be hard. boring. <laughs> I know, I know. I think there's certain products. So I try to think about it in different kinds of products. So, I mean, for like a fancy dress, like you kind of want to change it every single time. So that's kind of where rental plays better. Exactly. Uh, for purchasing things like basics, so like, you know, a t-shirt or mm-hmm. underwear or, um, you know, jeans are, are pretty basic. You can definitely buy those sustainably um, now and, and try to make them last as long as possible. And then add different accessories that you find at clothing swaps or secondhand stores and, and try to make it fun that way. That's a little bit about how I, I try to do it. Right trying to mix things up and having fun, but still kind of investing mm-hmm. in quality pieces. What do you think is the future of sustainable fashion? Um, yeah, a little bit what, what I've explained so far is really having the consumer um, take responsibility and, and think about their consumer uh, behaviors and, and trying to think about it this way where um, you know, they're getting more curious about what they wear. They're finding different options, local options. Uh, they're asking their retailers, they're asking the brands, they're asking manufacturers, what's in my clothes? Who made my clothes? Getting curious. So mm-hmm. really asking, when, when you, whenever you ask a question, um, I think it, especially in the, in the retail supply chain, like it stimulates a bunch of other questions. So it's a lot of behind the scenes work, but I've seen it for myself where, um, you know, some, like somebody will ask, uh, uh, manufacturer question and then they'll come back and they'll ask this and 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 it's like this whole chain where we're becoming more conscious the more questions we ask um, so really just asking more questions um, and yeah just I would I would love to see the industry kind of following these these approaches that I mentioned earlier where um, you know we have radical transparency about the chemicals that we're using we don't know the chemicals that are in our clothes but a lot of them can be toxic and, and why would we want to use those? Why would we want to circulate toxic materials? Um, and yeah, that we, we stop creating so much waste that we're designing materials and, and fabrics that are, are easy to recycle and, and are contributing to a circular system. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, as I mentioned earlier, reducing uh, the carbon that's going into the air, actually using it as a tool to as serving as a carbon sink or cleaning more water or, uh, making sure that all animals are treated fairly, that all humans are treated fairly in the, in the system. Uh, mm-hmm. That's that's my vision. That's what I would like to see for, okay, for, right. for, for sustainable fashion. Uh, as we are approaching the end of the interview, one last question. Uh, one advice for the listeners of Sustainability Explored? Ask questions. <laughs> I agree. Ask questions. <laughs> Ask questions. Educate yourself. There's so many, so many resources. Ask for, we work a lot with Cradle to Cradle certification. Um, and there needs to be a lot more consumer awareness about this. It's an amazing certification. Uh, we cover these five different categories, what I was explaining. And, and um, you know, trying to understand more. What, where do your clothes come from? And, and making more of these, these conscious choices. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Claudia. Have a great uh, day and uh, rest of the week and life. It was a big pleasure talking to you. You uh, opened a little bit the wheel of uh, sustainable fashion to me and hopefully yeah. to the listeners too. Yes, Let's keep in touch. My pleasure. And, yeah, great. Yes. Great having you as a guest. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.